Okay, so we're going to look now. I hope we're not going too fast paced. Uh, any questions on all those things above, do write them in the Q&A uh, and we can, we can either talk about them later uh, at the end. Uh, so do send in questions there, you can just type them in. Unfortunately, we can't hear people. Um, so you might be shouting at your monitor right now, but do type in um, any questions or thoughts, or even if you if you have a vision impairment yourself, if you want to say relay your experience of that particular particular vision loss that you might have, uh, how you navigate the world, um, how you found adapting that sort of thing, please do write that in, um, and we can have a look at that at the end. So we're going to look now at uh, a few different areas. So we've got lighting, contrast, touch size, speech and technology. And all being well, I'm going to hand over to Guy now. Are you uh, live with your microphone, Guy? Can you hear me? I can, yeah. You're a little bit muffled, but you're audible, so you might oh, have to well, speak up a little bit. OK, then. Are we, are we all right? Perfect. That's great. Yeah. I'll, I'll hand over to you now, Guy. Thank you. OK, then. Cheers, Matt. Yeah. Um, as we would all know, um, the lighting within any environment is key to being able to see what you can and can't do. Um, and for anybody with a visual impairment, that's especially the case um, and can have a major difference on anybody's ability to actually function and to perform any given task. Um, there's various types of lighting available that can help within that situation. And there's a list of those uh, on the slide on the screen. You've got um, floor standing lights, desk mounted lights, um, portable lights with or without um, being incorporated in a magnifier. Um, LED bulbs are all the rage these days and they're very good because they give off a light that is normally very um, useful for a visually impaired person and does allow them to uh, function better than some of the low energy lights that are bulbs that are available for that gave off a very um, poor level of quality. The type of light that they gave off wasn't particularly conducive to working if you had a visual impairment. Daylight bulbs are very good and the LED ones are coming almost to the stage where they're the equivalent of daylight. We used to recommend daylight bulbs all the time, but Often these days, they can be more difficult to get hold of um, with the move towards LED bulbs. Um, and you can get different coloured LEDs, so different coloured lights to signify different things on any given device or in any given situation. So that can help as well in terms of a change of colour, not necessarily for room lighting, but certainly um, a change in a light colour can indicate um, to somebody with a visual impairment that there is a different um, that, that that light is signifying, um, which can help um, often um, over and above the overall level of ambient lighting uh, within the room. So Mark, could we? Thank you. So in terms of the considerations when looking at lighting generally, um, there's, there's a number of things to bear in mind. Now, one of the first ones is is the lighting a known issue? Because if the person is coping well enough in the lighting they already have, then there's no need to make any adjustments. Um, it may be something else that's that, that's more more likely to be causing a problem than it is than the lighting. Um, the key things we look at was is the overall lighting in the room suitable? Is it too bright or is it too dim? Now. As Mark was talking earlier, in terms of glare issues with some eye conditions, you can have such a thing as too bright a room. Um, it's not necessarily just the uh, a room being dim that can cause problems, but a light a lighting in the room that's too bright can also cause issues there as well. And it might be that there's a lot of light coming in through a window that needs to be um, adjusted. So do you need to close some blinds to get rid of some of that glare? Um, do you need to, when you're trying to read something or sit and watch TV or whatever, do you need to change the positions around in the room to accommodate where the light is coming from and how strong that light is? It may well be that that's the case. Um, the other thing on that is in terms of overhead versus task lighting. Um, now, task lighting obviously is very specific to what you're trying to do. Is it lighting of a page of a book? Is it lighting around a desk area that you're working in? 
or is it to do with just the general ambient lighting within the within the the environment itself? So, is there overhead or task lighting that is required? Um, in terms of the use of additional lighting within the home, um, it might be that the County Council Vision Impairment Team can help with that. If somebody's registered and has a contact with the um, VI team, then it might be that they can come out and actually have a look around the home and say what would be suitable, what would not be suitable, and work with the visually impaired person to say to see what might actually help um, somebody feel more comfortable within their own home. In terms of whether the lighting level is good enough, as I said, there's a difference between good, uh, too bright and too dark. But um, generally, is it just about right? It's the old porridge argument, too hot, too cold or just about right. It's the same thing with lighting. In terms of looking at contrast, you can see if you can see those um, slides on the screen, you'll notice the difference in terms of how easy or otherwise it is to see the items that are on the plate and on the chopping board. Contrast can be a major thing to look at when you're assisting somebody who has a visual impairment or if you're trying to think, make things easier for yourself if you're visually impaired. Um, as we can see on the um, left hand side of that where we've got sandwiches on a plate. On the white plate those sandwiches are very difficult to distinguish um, whereas on the black plate certainly that white bread does stand out quite a lot. Um, with regards to being able to identify where the sandwiches are relative to the plate. On the right hand side of the picture we can see that there's some mushrooms there being cut up and again it's a white on black issue in the in the back um, illustration the mushrooms are on a white board and very very difficult to see whereas in the forward illustration they're on a black um, coloured chopping block and they can be much more easy to see. So it's quite understandable to see the difference that contrast can actually make. So thinking about the level of contrast and it may be a question of <clears throat> using contrast colour mats um, around the kitchen area or in, uh, in the home generally to help somebody actually notice the difference between an item that has been put down versus the surface on which it has been placed um, so that people can actually see and more easily identify where an object may, may be located, particularly in the case of drinks, where it's very, very easy to spill a drink if you can't actually locate where it might be on a desk or on a table. So like I've said already about offering food and drink, in terms of the plates, the cups and such like, make sure that the, the, those those things stand out from the surface on which they're put. It's so much easier to see if there is a difference in the colours. It doesn't necessarily have to be a straight black or black and white. It can be just dark versus light generally. Some people may see may work better with light on dark. Others work better with dark on light. The difference can be very, very personal on that in terms of the way people relate to the colours that are being used. In terms of the area that you're working in, um, generally you've got differences in the colour contrast, as I say, not just black or white, but also what can be the surrounding colours that are around. If things are all too pastel shade, then it's very, very difficult to see what's what and make out what is what on a desk, on a table or whatever. If there's a lot of glass around, it can be very, very difficult to work out what is what is a free space and what is somewhere where there's a table. Um, a particular a particular one there is uh, is when you're talking about glass doors that can be so difficult to see or notice that people will walk into them um, if they if they're not able to see that there is something there when it looks perfectly clear. Um, in terms of written materials, which we'll move on to again, this is linked this is linked into something we'll talk about in a minute, which is the size of text and such like. Um, certainly when producing materials for use by visually impaired people, contrast does have to be borne in mind. Anybody that receives our newsletter will see that we normally print that in a, on, a, on a high contrast black on yellow um, colour, which gives a very good um, contrast for most people. Um, and I think you'll have noticed if you've seen any of our materials that most of them are uh, the black on the highlight yellow colour that, um, that is, is very 
it's very much easier for people to actually be able to see in terms of using the contrast. And if you can, again, if you can see the slides on there, we've got an indication of how some color, color combinations don't really work. Um, there's a, a block there where you've got um, white text on a black background, which says easy to see. And I personally, vision impaired, cannot read the other bit in there. Mark, you might know who <laughs> typed it. Um, uh, I no. can't actually read what that says. I think it actually says hard to see, but oh, well, um, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. that makes it's, sense. Um, it's amazing how many companies use fancy colours and text like this, and they've produced something on a nice glossy leaflet, and you look at it and think, well, I have no idea what that says. So, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be too. Um, it doesn't have to be too bad for regular vision to actually make it very very difficult for somebody with a visual impairment. The colour the colour contrast can be such that it would look perfectly okay to somebody without a visual impairment. But as soon as somebody with VI looks at it, everything just blur, everything just disappears. The text disappears into the background, and it's it doesn't it wouldn't matter what size that text was. The the lack of contrast in the colours just make it impossible to actually read it. Okay, Mark. Going on to size, this is something that I've looked at, I've, I've mentioned earlier. Now, everybody, I think a lot of people probably in the audience today will be aware of the availability of large print um, in terms of um, size of text. We've got an illustration there of a large print diary, um, a, la a clock with larger uh, um, numerals on it so, so that somebody could see it more easily. And also in terms of magnification, that's another key area which Mark will go into with talking about technology. Um, but certainly size is a key indicator there. And the size makes a massive difference for a lot of people. It doesn't cure everybody's issues with reading or being able to uh, see things, but it does have a major impact on a lot of different, a lot of people with different eye conditions. It does have a, a massive effect. As I say, bigger, not necessarily better. It might be, as Mark mentioned earlier, that uh, rather than a magnifier, you're using a minifier to make things smaller. But generally, for a lot of people, bigger does make a, a difference. Large print is generally defined as 16 point as a minimum. But generally, that might not be as big enough for a lot of people to operate with. And again, they may need to use magnifiers, even if something's out of 16 point font. Now, many of you out there who aren't visually impaired may look at that and say, that's enormous, that's absolutely massive. It might look so to you, but for somebody with a visual impairment, that could be the absolute minimum that they're capable of working with. So it's worth thinking about the size of things. And this is something we come across, especially in emails. Um, yes, you can magnify your screen, but bear in mind a bit of consideration for somebody on the other end if they're visually impaired. That they might need the text size bigger in the first place uh, and might is certainly um, worth thinking about if you're actually writing something out going away from the computer side of things and the it and 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 smart device side of things if you're writing something consider using a bold thick pen rather than a thin pen um, it really does make things stand out and it makes every and it actually makes you write things larger in itself because of the thickness of the nib um, and it does therefore make things a little more bolder, um, higher contrast, going back to the contrast issue, uh, makes things stand out generally. Um, on the IT side of things, if we're looking at prints on screen print, if you can avoid the fancy fonts, again, I think in there it says something about fancy font, um, but again, I can't read that. That's very much, hand, that's very much hand, a handwriting font. Um, I don't know which one it is, but it's it's something that is can be really difficult to read. It may be bold and it may be have a high level of contrast, but the actual um, curly parts of that, known as the serif, um, are very very difficult to interpret and very very difficult to read. And the other side, the other point on that, when you're typing something up, avoid using all capitals. It can be very very difficult to distinguish between um, between letters when somebody has used all capitals for something. Apart from the fact, in most instances, that signifies you're shouting. 
um, really it should be avoided from the purposes of communicating with somebody with a visual impairment. In terms of magnifying size, now a lot of people will say, well, yeah, everything needs to be magnified. As Mark said earlier, that's not necessarily the case. It may be that um, that you need to get an appointment to see the um, low vision clinic at the Oxford Eye Hospital. To get exactly the right prescription for any given magnifier you may wish to use. Some people will do it by trial and error, but sometimes you will need actually to go and see what your prescription needs to be from the eye hospital. For those of you out there who are preparing materials for consumption by visually impaired people, realistically, it, you do need to look at offering things in large print, particularly if they are printed materials. As we've said, it, it, electronic materials, web materials, email materials can be magnified on the screen. Often that's not available if something is printed. And I know in particular, we bang on about this a lot, but a lot of the uh, NHS and government organisations generally are very, very poor at this in terms of offering a, um, a large print version. But in a commercial environment, it's well worth considering, can you actually offer things in large print? A recent experience I've had was with um, a bank who couldn't, in, couldn't actually provide anything with, in large print. I just received a blown up A3 copy of an A4 sheet and even then the contrast wasn't good enough. I won't give away the bank, but I probably will by saying it was blue and black. Um, <laughs> that um, it was, it was in, practically impossible, even when it was magnified to a, an A3 size for me to be able to read it. And that was a combination of size and contrast that was failing to allow me to do that. So it's worth considering printed materials if you are producing those sort of things. Yeah, that's a really good point about the A3 because that, that sometimes people's default is, oh, okay, I'll just blow it up on A3. Um, and the, the results are usually pretty poor. Um, you know, it, it's a photocopy of a copy. Um, and, you know, I, did, I went through my whole education with photocopies of A3 yeah, yeah, yeah. And with, with yeah. books photocopied and half the paragraph cut off at the end. And because it's shiny, suddenly you just yeah. get this black blob in the middle of the page so and actually yeah not yeah and it does tend to lose definition as well by definition by enlarging it like that it tends to lose definition yeah. so if the original's not very that good in the first place you blow it up you actually make it worse <laughs> yeah brilliant <laughs> okay brilliant thank you guy um i'm going to take on this one so touch um so the use of touch can really be very helpful for people um, we look at something called bump-ons. So um, on the, the image on the left-hand side of this screen, what you've got is a it's actually an oven dial, um, and somebody's actually put two bump-ons on there. But that um, they're at a point on the oven dial, so I'm not sure where it's at. 200 degrees probably. So you can actually then feel the dial and turn the dial to that raised dot. Um, you can also see on the screen here, we've actually got a card reader. So next time you go and um, make a payment, which isn't contactless, it's worth actually having a look at the, um, or a feel of the keypad. And you'll notice that there's a little dot on the number five. And this is the same principle. You'd also realize if you've got a home telephone or a work phone, there's probably, there should be, a raised dot on that number five as well in the middle. And you can actually, find any number from that raised dot so you can work your way around um, the the keypad and obviously the principle is you wouldn't put a dot on every number otherwise you'd have no idea so which numbers which so the same principle applies to these bump ons these sticky dots so when you put them on a washing machine you might only put it to say 30 degrees but then they know that say one turn on from that is 40 degrees or on the oven, you know that turning the dial to 200 degrees, you know that actually if you turn it slightly more, you can go to 210 or slightly less, 190. So you can actually use it as a navigation um, aid. Um, we've also put on here Braille, which we touched on a little bit earlier. Uh, we've got some Braille on the script, on the um, on an image on the right hand side there. Um, let's move on. So considerations to make. So depending on the person you're working with. Um, if you're in their home, do they need their appliances marking up? So if someone says to you, I'm really struggling with my microwave or my washing machine or my cooker, I can't see the numbers. 
actually using these sticky dots, these bump ons, we can just send them to them. Um, the visual impairment team can set them up as well in their home. They could put these sticky dots on. So worth always asking people if they're struggling with that, actually there could be some very simple adaptations. And some people just get creative themselves. I've known people to use Velcro uh, or anything with an adhesive back that's raised. You know, they've been creative uh, and made their own sort of uh, raised dots. Um, and in your environment and where you work, are there sort of the correct tactile markers in place? So do your card machines, which they should have, but do they have the tactile markers on? Um, tactile paving. So we're not going to go into this in too much detail. Um, but if you, if you have a, a building, is there tactile markings at the top and the bottom of the stairs to identify the staircases there? Um, you'll see tactile marking all over the streets, tactile paving. There's various different forms which a cane user or a guide dog user can detect to know where a crossing is and what type of crossing that is. Um, do your lifts have tactile markings, etc.? Uh, I've put here Braille, so are you prepared to offer your materials in Braille if requested? Um, and are Braille signs necessary? And I put that question mark there because it's worth thinking about uh, and looking into um, where you can get Braille from uh, and check with us. You don't necessarily have to have it printed, everything print, you know, printed in Braille there and then. Um, but it's worth just being prepared if somebody does ask for your materials in Braille, where are you going to get it from? So having that lined up and ready and knowing where you can go to save you time, to save you embarrassment and to, to actually provide a good service for somebody. Um, it's always great when you go into a restaurant or cafe or business and they actually offer large print or Braille. Um, it just shows they've gone that extra step. It shows they're thinking about their customers. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit more forward thinking. Um, I'm going to move on now to speech and sound. Um, so there are many talking products out there. Now this is great. So normally in person, I would hand around some talking items and the talking clock, everyone would be pressing it uh, and annoying each other and finding out what the time is. Um, but there are various different products that can help people with vision impairment. So from talking watches to bathroom scales, um, meat thermometers, kitchen timers, um, you name it, they make talking products. Uh, so on the screen, I've got a talking, um, talking scales and talking clock. And uh, whenever we demonstrate the talking scales, everybody has a good laugh about not wanting to know their weight or shout it out loud. Um, or one person at a time kind of jokes come out. So uh, we've heard them all. <laughs> um, so some considerations you need to make. Um, does the person you're assisting need to start using items with speech? So perhaps they're struggling with their watch or their clock, um, or they're struggling with their scales or anything around the kitchen. Do they need to go and now move over to using speech rather than trying to use their vision. Uh, and it might be that they have sort of usable vision, uh, so they have macular degeneration, but actually that vision isn't all that reliable. So they've made a few mistakes when making a cake. Um, you know, they've put in too much flour or, or too much salt or too much sugar uh, and they've, they've ruined the cake. So, you know, things like that, you know, they'll, they'll come up in conversation generally uh, and then you can sort of suggest, you know, is, is a speech better for you? Um, if they're struggling to read print, consider audiobooks. Um, so there are many ways to access audiobooks uh, and we can help with that. So a referral to us, giving our number out. It might be that they're an avid reader and they've not really considered audiobooks. There's a lot of free options now through RNIB, a charity called Calibre as well. If you want to pay a bit more money, you've got Amazon Audible. Could be done on various different devices. They now do them on USB memory sticks, um, or you can download them, still get them on CD. Um, but yeah, you could get a lot of audiobooks. And it's also talking newspapers. So we've got talking newspapers locally. So we've got Oxtalk in Oxford, uh, and then we've got others at Dawn, which is Didcot, Abingdon and Wantage. And then we've got uh, Wallingford, Henley, Whitney, Banbury, talking newspapers across the county. And then you've also got national talking newspapers um, and magazines, which the RNIB do, again, on memory stick or on download. So if people are wanting to use 
I'll also listen to um, the news on audio. It's a really good way to stay connected. Absolutely brilliant services locally. So um, really, really good service. Uh, so do recommend that if you're working with somebody or give us a call and we can give a bit more information. Um, and are there any materials you uh, need to provide in spoken form? So rather than um, rather than in text, can it be either um, a record an automated voice or a human voice? So do you have leaflets, which might be better off in speech? Uh, do you have uh, a quarterly magazine? So we have a newsletter which goes out each quarter and we also provide that in audio uh, and people receive that on a memory stick or download it from the website. Um, and it's just another way of accessing material. So again, you know, it's not necessarily saying you should do that, but are you prepared to do that? Uh, is it something you can offer? It doesn't have to be costly. There are plenty of ways with technology you can do that now. Um, plenty of ways you can do it yourself if you're willing to record it yourself onto your computer. You don't need a fancy recording studio. It can be done very easily. So do consider it. Now, uh, this is actually going to be a webinar in itself uh, at some point, uh, but technology. Uh, myself and Guy are, love technology, so we will do at some point um, when we get our heads together, we will do a separate webinar on technology for people who are visually impaired. There's a lot of material online it's worth looking into, but technology is huge at the moment. It's advanced uh, and most mainstream tech uh, has inbuilt accessibility nowadays. So whether it's color, size or speech, uh, it's not only can smartphone be accessible, but you can also get specialist apps which can help things, things like navigation, recognizing objects and more. And again, uh, unfortunately, because of the, the start of the webinar, we're not really able to do a demonstration of um, the smartphone apps, but when we do the tech one, we probably will. Um, but there's a lot of apps on, on the smartphone which can scan text and read it aloud to you, scan objects and recognize them, tell you when the next bus is coming, um, tell you what street you're in and which direction you're going, all those kind of things. And if you've got a smartphone, always worth having a look. Go into the settings, go into accessibility and just have a look around to see what's there. There's a lot of stuff available, um, whether it's text size, whether it's speech. Uh, whether it's colour contrasting, uh, there's a lot of things in there. So again, we can help individuals with that. Um, so, so some considerations to make, uh, are they using technology to help them? Do they need help accessing technology? So a referral to us if necessary. So these questions come up a lot now, particularly with Zoom. I want to be able to do Zoom calls, I want to Skype, um, I want to see my grandchildren, I want to be able to email, I want to do online shopping. You know, we, we, we get this a lot um, and they want to be able to access it. And we're dealing with a lot of people who've never used devices before. So never used a computer, never used a smartphone. And there's a lot out there, a lot of simple technology as well. So we can show people some of these simple devices. Things are being made easier to use. Um, and you may actually find some people you're working with will prefer to receive information via email instead of in print. So they can actually adjust the text size or have it read aloud to them. So like I was saying in the size of in print size, actually it is 10 times better if you can use a device, if you can have it sent to you via email, because then you can manipulate that text. You can have that text read aloud to you. Uh, it's a lot easier to access than say a printed letter that's sent in the post. Uh, so again, make sure, you know, are, are your systems able to do that? Are you able to email out to people? Um, uh, and so again, this is probably another webinar from us, but is all your web content accessible? So including documents and social media posts. So are you making sure you're considering accessibility with social media posts? Um, things like image descriptions uh, on your social media posts. Uh, are your links um, accessible? Are your hashtags accessible? Documents, so document accessibility, a lot of uh, things available in Microsoft Word. Again, another webinar more detail in, but there's a lot you can do um, with headings, links, making sure your links um, don't just say click here, but they actually tell you where you're going um, for screen reader users. Um, 
yeah there's a lot lot of stuff in there but again you can look into some of that yourself uh, if you're you know in control of that sort of thing or worth asking the questions with the teams you work with are these things accessible because actually it might be depending on we've got a lot of people watching this today who are from different backgrounds so what i'll say is you know if you if you have a website or you have documents out there and that is the first point of call for people to get to you then actually if there's a barrier there to get to you then it might be why you know you don't see so many visual people if they can't access your information online then you know that they've got to a hurdle and they've turned around and and not bothered to continue so you don't want to have that sort of hurdle for people um but yeah lots of information in that which we can look at at another point now um how are we doing for time okay so we're hoping to round up by 12 so uh, we're going to rattle through this a little bit but communication and guiding uh, again it's sorry to say any questions on all those adaptations and equipment please do send them in if you're a user of a piece of equipment or a piece of technology do share your experience we can read it out uh, always interested to hear it's not just about me and guy uh, there are a lot of you know everybody is completely different so please share what you use what your opinions are on different things different adaptations be really interested to read those out so we are going to look at communication and guiding so we're going to look at language introductions mobility and then guiding at the end so <laughs> what i've put on the screen now is a whole load of words partially sighted blind visually impaired look see vip sight impaired sight loss vi person sighted these are all terms which people use in different ways regarding vision um so and the big question mark in the middle there are what words should you use or shouldn't you use um with somebody who has a visual impairment uh, so we've put up here language is important but everybody will be will prefer to be referred in a different way so just ask um you know if, if you're worried about it just ask not many people get that offended by being called blind if they're not totally blind and they'll probably just correct you if you call them if you say blind and they say oh actually i'm visually impaired i can see a bit or or something along those lines so try not to get too hung up on that but do ask again everybody's unique everybody's different and don't make assumptions um, and don't be afraid to ask what they can or can't see and how much vision they have uh, I don't know about you guys, but I actually prefer it if they do ask. Um, I would rather, yeah, rather somebody who I've never met before say, you know, what what can you see? You know, what what's helpful? Rather than either, yeah. I'd rather that than them make assumption. Yeah, yeah, and it happens. Most people do make an assumption. They see the cane, they make the assumption that you can't see a thing. Mm. And then you have to explain, actually, I can see a bit or I can read large print or whatever, depending on the situation. But, you know, that and, and that kind of leaves it a bit awkward. Just ask, just ask, you know, what can you see? I've never met anybody who's gone, who's been offended by that. No. Most people, I mean, you've got the problem here where most people are probably going to tr try to tell you their their hit their medical history and give you all the background. <laughs> so, you know, it might open a can of worms, but um, it most people are happy to tell you what they can or can't see and then you know you, then you then you know um you know and that's better for everybody and it's, i think it's as much it's as much part of um the introductory process you know mm. you, it's just another question another topic of the conversation when you first mm. meet somebody yeah um that is the same as you know as you know what how old are what do you do what do you you know what do you yeah. do for a living what do you it's it's just another another question, another subject of of, of conversation, yeah. rather than being an elephant in the room that's just yeah. ignored. Yeah, and it can become an elephant in the room for a lot of people, including the visually impaired person, because you think, well, yeah. what point do I say? You know, well, yeah, and actually, it's some, amazing. Some, it's amazing yeah. how how it can be embarrassing, very embarrassing for the visually impaired person if it's not even mentioned. Yeah, yeah um yeah other things that don't be afraid to use words like see or look uh, they're unlikely to be offended they might make a joke about it um uh, but it's very common to say phrases like did you watch doctor who last night etc so you know 
Um, yes, and visually impaired people do watch TV. So did you watch, the, you know, saying watch is fine. And, and it's always hilarious that when they go, oh, no, I, I mean, did you listen? <laughs> you, know, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. just, you know, just calm down. It's OK. <laughs> um, avoid using facial expressions purely to convey your point. Uh, so, yeah, this is quite common. And I don't know about you guys, but the amount of times when you ask somebody a question, and they nod and yeah. then you ask them again and then they're annoyed because like yes yes i did yes like, oh sorry or they raise their eyebrows or they smile for an answer um that's so frustrating yeah because <laughs> yeah, i mean you do lose you know part of language is non-verbal communication and with a visual impairment you lose a lot of that so yeah. you have to have people relying on verbal communication that to actually to actually talk to you, to actually get you get the point across, because mm. you can't pick up on the non-verbal cues. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we can talk about introductions now, all very similar topics, but so when approaching someone with a visual impairment, uh, it's essential to uh, introduce yourself. Uh, what I mean by that is to say your name. Uh, so say uh, if I'm meeting Guy, I'd always say, hello, Guy, it's Mark. And even if we've known, you know, known each other for years, you might recognise my voice. It's always worth doing because it might be a crowded area, might not hear properly, might not be able to detect your voice properly. I always say, even if you've known him for years, still still use that. Um, still just say, say your name. And if you're representing a business or an organisation, I'd say it's Mark from Oxfordshire Association for the Blind. And it gives them reassurance particularly if you're if you're in a restaurant or cafe or you know or a shop and you're trying to find you know somebody that works there and if you go up and introduce yourself you know i'm here from tesco then at, at least i know then i'm not just talking to a random stranger um you know a lot of people don't know whether somebody works there or whether they're just shopping um and always, so always ask if they need assistance. They may well be absolutely fine. So again, this goes on our, you know, constant point, never make assumptions, just ask. So we'll look at guiding in just a second. Do they need guiding? Just ask. Uh, please don't grab arms, canes, pull or push anyone. Uh, we'll look at the sighted guiding video in a minute. Uh, just a no, no, really, please don't grab people um, unannounced. So, and address the person directly, not someone else on their behalf. So if they're with somebody, please talk to them and not about them to the other person. It's very common uh, with disability. And that's just a fear. You know, people just have a fear of disability. They don't know how that person is going to react or how to react around them. But they are a human being. They're a person. So react around them just as you would anybody else. Um, we're in a group setting. So use the person's name to address them when asking a question again. So they're unlikely to notice your eye contacts. This goes on the facial expression point again as well. If you're in a group setting, the amount of times people just look at you and ask a question and, and everybody stands there in silence and you have to say, oh, you're talking to me. So get over that embarrassment just by saying the name. Um, so mobility. Uh, we've got some drawings here from RNIB of the different types of canes. So these are, I think, you know, white canes, long canes, whatever you want to call them. Um, so we start off top left is a symbol cane. So this will be used as a symbol of visual impairment. So it's to be held out in front, not, so not to be used on the ground. So they're not using it to detect objects and to, to, um, to tap around as we see with a long cane in a minute. They're, they're holding it out in front. And it's for people to know that they've got a visual impairment. Uh, a guide cane, so this is uh, a symbol so it's a symbol and a guide to help with curbs and um, trip hazards. It's not that commonly used. Most people use a long cane. It's very similar. So a guide cane is sort of in between uh, and it can help you detect curbs. Uh, you kind of drag it in front of you, push it in front of you uh, and it can detect curbs and objects and also symbolize that you're visually impaired. Now bottom left, so it's actually a long longer cane so it's a long cane and this is used to sweep across in front of a person to detect curves objects changes in surfaces and levels um, so yeah it, you'll often see a, a cane with a roller ball on the end and they'll be rolling it around uh, so sweeping in like an arc form and this you generally need um, 
training to use a long cane like this. So this is where the visual impairment team, which will have details at the end in the county council, will give training on how to use a long cane uh, and looking at routes, safe routes for you to use um, in your local area, whatever your situation. And here at the end, uh, we have a red and white striped cane or, or red stripes on a white cane. Uh, and these are added to cane and this is to indicate that the person also has a hearing impairment. So they're hearing impaired as well when you see a red and white cane. So you, they'll have hearing and vision loss. Um, so we're going to look at guide dogs now very briefly. Uh, and there's a amusing image on the right with a person, a cartoon with a person with a guide dog and a speech bubble with the guide dog is actually on a telephone. Uh, and it says, I told you not to call me whilst at work, Denise. Uh, and so it's just a play on the joke really of distracting guide dogs, which is a no-no. If a guide dog is on their harness, their owner, you shouldn't go up to them, you shouldn't pet them, you shouldn't distract them from working. They are working dogs. Um, so you could find a lot of information about guide dogs on their website, um, but you and the guide dog are a partnership and you'll need each other to successfully navigate your way around. So I've put a little bit here because there's a lot of misconceptions about guide dogs and their training. So throughout training, a guide dog learns to so walk centrally along the pavement whilst avoiding obstacles on the route, not to turn, not turn corners unless told to do so, stop at curbs and steps, find doors, crossings and places which are visited regularly, judge height and width so you don't bump your head or shoulders, um, helps keep you straight when crossing a, crossing a road. But it's up, this is a really big point here, but it's up to you to decide where and when to cross safely. So whilst your guide dog can do all of these things to help you get, get out and about, you will need to give commands, provide encouragement and tell the dog which way to go. Think of it as you being the navigator and your dog being the driver. Um, so yeah, a guide dog doesn't do everything for you. Um, they don't tell you when to cross. They don't tell you, uh, they don't re re read the menu for you in a shop, in a restaurant. Uh, I always love these anecdotes you hear come up every now and again where somebody with a guide dog asks for directions and the person bends down and gives them to the dog. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, just a little bit of common sense with that one. Um, but yeah, they are working animals. But the main thing to really know if you meet somebody with a guide dog, not distract them, not try and take over, not try and um, take over the dog or anything like that. It's a partnership with that person and the dog. Uh, it's a very special partnership as well. Um, it takes a lot of training. You don't just pick up your dog from the local guide dog center and there you go. It's a lot of effort, a lot of training between you and the dog. Um, so and it's not for everybody. But you know that can be assessed by guide dogs and the individual. <laughs>